So this is Yode with functional correctness, Haskelling your way to reliable code. Thank Have you fun. very much for the introduction. Really got to start. So first of all, yeah, it's just me. Uh, Foxy, my co-presenter, actually is not able to present. Sadly, he has like some kind of throat stuff going on. So um, he decided didn't want to spend an hour talking about this stuff. Um, so it's just me. Uh, I have to apologize in advance for the case. I'll like stutter and stumble around, do that because I had to reshuffle a little bit. And, and yeah, we'll see how it goes, but I'm sure it will be bearable, hopefully. Um, so who am I actually? Like, like, like just was told, um, I started out as a biologist in bachelor and master. And at some point, I really fell down the math and theory rabbit hole. And um, at some point, I basically became like a kind of biomathematician, applied math person kind of stuff. And when I did my PhD later, it was like 99% math stuff, pencil and paper kind of stuff. So I do have obviously quite a bit of experience also with programming, most, mostly things like statistical stuff. So you take some numbers, numbers go in, you do something, numbers go out. Uh, doesn't contrast this means I do not really have proper experience when it comes to real world software engineering. So when it's all about making code as a product you want to sell. And of course, I never had any formal training or education in computer science. This is actually where my co-presenter wanted to contribute to this part because he has a background in electrical engineering and then went into software development. But you'll just have to bear with me alone with me and my perspective that will be rather applied and a bit of, of like hands-on instead of coming from the complete theoretical science of, of uh, theoretical computer science. And like was already mentioned, I kind of fell down and fell in love with Haskell, probably also very related to me doing lots of math stuff. There are some striking similarities. But it was always more of a thing like, I think this was kind of cool, but I never really had any obvious way to do something with it until last year, 2023, when on a whim, basically, I decided I want to challenge myself to solve the entirety of Advent of Code completely in Haskell, just to force myself to really do this. And I actually succeeded. Some days I had to spend many hours on that, but I managed to do it. I tried it in the year before too, but I missed. I, I simply wasn't able to, to finish one of these challenges, so I failed overall. But Last year, I was able to do it. And in the process, I really learned lots of things and thought about many things. And I really realized how cool some of these things are that you can do with Haskell. So I decided, yeah, we really need to spread the gospel a bit and maybe try to also get some other people into that. OK, actually, before I start, I, some days ago, I was sent this comic by a friend of mine who's also a fan of Haskell. And I really realized we need to put this into the slide deck because it is really, really typical. So. When you aren't really familiar with the topic of functional programming and you hear people talking about that, then they will probably say lots of complicated words. They will say, yes, I find the immutable nature of functional languages particularly elegant and the declarative style facilitates reasoning about programming. We have lots of that stuff. But if you're new to this kind of stuff, then it probably much rather sound to you like rabbit dogs barking up a tree. And that's perfectly OK. And it is perfectly also OK if you first react in a way like the, the person there going, what the fuck? But going back to the first part of the comic, I think I can promise you that at the end of this talk, these things will make sense to you. And maybe you will also find yourself agreeing to some of these things that these people say there. So to get started, the main selling point when we handed in this talk was, of course, centered all around code correctness. And I wanted to really give this obligatory disclaimer that was also given in the introduction. Writing reliable code is, of course, not one-to-one -one perfectly equivalent to writing code in Haskell or any other functional programming language. It makes it a bit easier, but if you really try hard, you can also do in functional programming stuff things that will shoot you in the foot. And conversely, you can also use any other language and can also write in other languages um, and produce secure and reliable code. But functional programming has some quirks that make it somewhat easier to not shoot yourself in the foot. And that's, I think, the main selling point here when I center this talk around. Of course, the plan here is to shill Haskell and try to get as many of you into writing in Haskell or functional programming languages as possible. But of course, not everybody can or wants to switch programming styles or programming language. That's also perfectly OK. And even if you decide it's not for you or you don't have time or resources, then you may hopefully still catch some of these concepts that we will or that I will be talking about and maybe decide that you can incorporate one or a few of these concepts into your everyday coding and profit from these 
either way, despite not making the switch. So I guess that's another, I guess, value proposition of this talk that you might find useful. Okay, so why do we actually care about secure and reliable software in the first place? And I have two lovely examples. First, they're very illustrative and funny. And secondly, they illustrate some things that will in turn motivate some of the stuff that we will talk about in a few seconds. So the first example, I'd like to start by showing this picture here. Does anybody actually happen to recognize this thing? Oh no, okay, nice, that's, that's a funny one. So this is actually, or rather it was, the Mars Climate Orbiter. And there's a whole site on the nasa.gov domain, actually, we'll be able to click the link when the slide deck is published. And this was a rather expensive thing, 200 million manufacturing costs alone. The whole project costed, I think, like half a billion or something because you had to pay for the launch and the people working and whatever. So this was rather expensive. And this was actually supposed to be something really cool for science because this, um, this probe was supposed to study the, the um, climate history of Mars, but also supposed to look for water and answer lots of really important, cool scientific questions. So in 1999, this thing was launched, neared Mars, began to, to um, do what it's called the orbit insertion. So it was supposed to pass through the atmosphere. And then the plan was that it was supposed to circle around Mars. And at the moment when it was like, in the, or in, the, in the orbit, in the atmosphere, on the other side of Mars, then it was supposed to, to call back to Earth. But no signals were ever received afterwards. So it started to do this insertion, and then every contact was lost. So what happened? Well, people were able to find it out later. Uh, the official report said there was a sort of navigational error happening. And the details, and this is really brutal, the details were based or well, caused by a rather simple misunderstanding. The commands that were sent from the, from the command center on the Earth were sent in, in English or imperial units, in this case, uh, pound times seconds. So the numbers that were fed into these, um, these well, thrust things that are supposed to correct the position. But this probe was uh, manufactured by Lockheed and Martin, an old and proud uh, engineering firm, which, of course, following good engineering practice, used metric units. So the orbiter assumed these numbers were metric units, in this case, Newton seconds. And they later were able to reconstruct what happened. It turned out the probe was, I think, off by 100 kilometers or so from its intended position. And when it entered the orbit, um, it well, was not prepared for these specific set of circumstances. Uh, it experienced lots of stress upon entering. And simply because of the force of the, of the shear forces, it disintegrated due to these atmospheric stresses and was lost due to a very simple and, well, preventable error. And we got a second example, too. It's also from the, from the realm of, of rocket engineering. Um, Looks like this. Maybe some of you have has seen this before. Neither. Oh, you have. Yes. Do, do you know what this is? Uh, kinda. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 a kind of unit thing. Yes. It's um, the Ariane 5, or rather, it was the Ariane 5 flight uh, 501. And here, upon launch, it all looked very nice and clean, supposed to be. But 37 seconds afterwards. It looked like that, which was not supposed to be happening, of course. So what happened was 30 seconds after takeoff, so 37 seconds after the whole launch sequence started, the rocket suddenly deviated in a right angle from its intended path. And then it's experienced what was called severe aerodynamic stresses. Well, obviously, the boosters ripped off at the side. You can see these things flying, flying away in the, in the background. And the rocket realized, hey, that's not supposed to happen. So I better destruct myself to prevent this well, thing throwing itself back onto Earth or something. And as it turned out, this was really, really weird. Yeah, exactly, you're nodding. It was a kind of unit conversion thing. This internal reference system, abbreviated SRI, I guess it probably stands for something French or something, experienced an aromatic overflow because a 64-bit floating point number was supposed to be converted into a 16-bit integer, but it didn't fit into that because at some point, 30 seconds, uh, 37 seconds afterwards, the numbers became too big, and then it caused an overflow. And the SRI noticed that, um, it, the, the problem actually was that it was reused from the Ariane 4 without any changes, which was a problem because the forces acting upon the Ariane 5 were much larger. And at some point, the numbers became too big for this thing to handle. So the SRI was smart enough to notice something is wrong and it entered a failed state to prevent further damage. So that's a good thing. And it started to output a diagnostic value intended for debugging purposes, which 
in theory is also a good thing, but the problem is this was directly hooked to the flight control system, which then took these weird diagnostic debugging symbols and thought, hey, yeah, okay, so that's how I have to navigate. Luckily, there was a backup SRI, which is good, but the problem is the backup SRI was a complete replicate of the main one, so it did the exact same thing because it was identical. So the flight control system suddenly got super weird numbers and figured, hey, that ain't right. I need to correct my rocket's course based on these new numbers that are coming in. Well, yeah, that was the result that stemmed from that. So two funny examples why we may want to care about software reliability and software security and what happens if we do not. So to get started, maybe we want to think if we were to write a wish list to center, what kind of stuff would we wish for in an ideal world? So ideally, we would be dealing with code that we just need to look at for a few seconds and would see instantly simply by looking at it like a mathematician can look at a formula. Yes, that's quite obviously correct. It can't be wrong. It needs to look that way. There's no way this is false. And secondly, ideally, if we still make an error, because at some point we will, then hopefully we might be able to find as many of them at compile time already. So ideally, we won't experience any runtime problems, but the compiler will yell at us and say, nope, that can't be right. Please write again. I won't accept that. And in such an ideal world, we would also be able to fearlessly refactor, as it's called. It's like kind of a bit of a catchphrase or buzzword. So it just means we can hands-on dive in the code. If we want to change something, we change it. And if we made an error by mistake, then it will be instantly becoming obvious and the compiler will yell at us and we can fix the problem. And if you think about these classical software engineering books on refactoring, for instance, this one by Martin Fowler, which is a rather thick tome by now, the left one is the second version, apparently refactoring is nothing that seems to be particularly very easy and straightforward, otherwise we wouldn't have these big books about that. So ideally this would be becoming somewhat simpler and easier to do and in a really ideal world, we would also be able to reduce test cases and, and writing validation code as much as possible because obviously writing test cases is not really the most fun thing to do. So ideally, we would be able to do away all of that. And of course, what I'm now claiming is that we can maybe not entirely get 100% of this, but we can come sufficiently close to such an ideal world if we decide to use something from the realm of functional programming. And if we naively just enter this phrase into our favorite online encyclopedia, we'll get this, well, bunch of paragraphs with lots of many fancy sounding words. I will highlight a few of them that will kind of set the stage about the things that we will be talking about. So something that always crops up is people talking about applying and composing functions. So, well, obviously functional programming seems to be a lot of functions, who would have thought. Um, something that also crops up often is talk, um, people talking about programming in a declarative way. We will be talking about declarativeness uh, in a few seconds because that's really one of the, the core aspects. We'll also hear often that instead of thinking about a sequence of imperative statements like we would maybe write in C, where we tell the computer step by step what we want to do, we much rather do not want to do that, but instead, well, would try to do something else, which I will mention in a second. Um, namely something that's, well, actually supposed to, to um, relate to this applying and composing mathematical functions. Functions apparently are so important that they are treated as what is called first-class citizens. And again, declarative and composable style, again, small functions, again, we want to combine them in some kind of modular manner. So this seems to be some kind of recurring theme, which we will be talking about. Um, we will also talk about something that's called purity. A function can be pure. This is something that is a very nice thing. It is related to if you put something into a function, you will always get the very same out of the function. So there's nothing else that changes what the function is doing. And this is a very nice thing. We will be talking about avoiding mutable state. We will talking quite a bit about avoiding side effects. These are particularly evil and something that we really want to avoid. And again, this is something that contrasts with the classical impure procedural paradigm that's very typical in imperative programming languages, where we will have side effects, we will have global states, and this is something that we want to avoid. And finally, well, recursion will crop up a little bit. We will not be talking explicitly about recursion, but recursion is just, just something you will do a lot naturally when you do functional programming. We will talk heavily about type systems. Types are a very nice thing. Types will help us a lot. And we will talk about very briefly about this, this really imposing sounding word referential transparency that's 
actually a verb that comes from analytical philosophy, I was told, and that sounds very, very smart. It's actually a super trivial concept, and everybody, upon hearing what I'm about to say on that slide, will be saying, yeah, that's kind of trivial, isn't it? Yes, it is, but it's still a nice word to know, because if you want to appear smart, you can mention that, and then everybody thinks you're the smartest person in the room. Okay, so too long didn't read of that slide. Well, lots of things that will make our life easier, and this is a little bit of the agenda of what is now to follow. We will talk about small and pure functions, pure meaning without side effects, without state. Ideally, they will be written in what's called a declarative uh, manner, and they will hopefully be able to be verifiable by inspection, so by looking at them. We will talk about purity, how it's related to this ominous referential transparency. We will talk about when we have functions, how can we apply them, how can we put them together to actually build the software that we want to build. Um, again, this will lead to something that's called the declarative style and allows us to, e uh, to easily reason about what we're doing. And then the second chunk of the talk will be all about the type system that will help us catching many, many evil things at compile time already, reducing the risk of runtime errors tremendously um, because it basically ensures that different parts of the code will be working together as intended. So let's start with functions. Well, I guess it makes sense to start with a very simple example, namely a function that could be called is palindrome. So assume we have a string, any arbitrary string, and we want to check if this string is a palindrome. To briefly remind you, pal palindrome is something that, when you read it backwards, is still the same. So ABA would be a palindrome, because read backwards, it's still ABA. So in Python, or any other imperative language, if you were really naive without using any fancy um, stuff, you would probably write it something like that. You would declare your function, which is supposed to take a string and returns a boolean that indicates whether the string that you fed into it is or is not a palindrome. And then for convenience, you usually would like to store the length of the string because you will use that over and over again in the function. So you can, you don't have to, but you can put it in a variable that you may want to call n. And then what you will try to do is you will go through the string letter by letter, and actually I have a blackboard here, so this is really cool, so I can illustrate what I'm actually meaning. So assume our, our string is supposed to be something like A, B, B, C, B, B, A. What this loop is then supposed to do, it would start at zero, and starting at zero, it would look and compare this zero char and compare it with the N minus I minus one. I actually check that, it is right, we will be talking about this weird thing. So in this case, it simply means in this case, it's the last one. So in the first loop iteration, it will compare these two things here and says, yeah, well, that's nice. Uh, it's the same, so we will just continue. If it were to notice that it's not the same, then it would return false, because obviously then it can't be a palindrome. But as we see, it's correct, it's the right thing, so we just continue with this loop. Then in the second iteration, we would compare these here, still the same still the same at the end we would be here, and then actually the loop would continue and basically have like this kind of overflow where we do all the comparisons again. Let's just not think about that. It doesn't really matter. But the idea here is in an imperative paradigm like in Python, you would do this with a kind of loop, and ultimately at the end you would hopefully return true if all of these equalities hold. So let's think about this way of writing this function. It is smallish, kind of, it's only a few lines, so I guess that's, that's, still, that's still nice. But then some things crop up. Well, is it really easy to identify if we look at that? I guess it's kind of, but this weird thing here, this is a bit weird. I think if you haven't written this function, you would look at it, you would probably have to think a few seconds about it. And to be honest, when I wrote this function, I first, first made an error there. I forgot that I have to subtract one. So I, do, I did it with n minus i and ran into errors. So even I myself, who have, has written that in preparation for this talk, made an error here. So this is a little bit weird. And secondly, yes, there is something that's called mutable state. It's only technically because we decided to do so. Namely, we allocated a bit of memory, um, call it n in this case, and we wrote this number, this length of the string into n. In this case, there's really no necessity to do that. So that's why I say, well, yeah, technically in this function there is. But this is really one of those cases where this is not really a problem. It could be a problem if the function was much larger and this variable n would be modified at different places in this piece of code. Because then it would be harder to keep track of what exactly is standing in n at this point of time, what is the function doing here, then it jumps around, it changes something, and then it would be easy to get confused. So while this may work, it is 
not kind of really, you cannot really look at it and say, yeah, looks good, it needs to be correct. You have to think about it a bit. And whenever you have to think about something, you can make a mistake. So ideally, you would like to try to avoid that as much as possible. So what would be the, the Haskell way of doing that? Well, it is, the first line is rather similar, and this is something that you would always like to do in Haskell, you first declare the types. You necessarily don't have to, but it is good practice for multiple reasons, which we will be talking about in the second part of the talk. But you first say, well, my function is palindrome, it takes a string, returns a boolean. Okay, I guess that's fairly obvious. And the remaining part of the function is just that, nothing more. And this may look a little bit confusing because there's a one equality and then there are two equality signs, might look a bit confusing, so let's go through this step by step. So first we say we have this function that's called is palindrome and it takes exactly one parameter. In this case, we call it S. Then there's this single equality sign that just says, well, what's supposed to follow the second yellow block is the body of the function. And the body of the function is just this comparison with a double equality of the string S that is thrown into it with the reverse of S. And if these two things are the same, then the function obviously returns true, otherwise not. And that's all, that's the whole thing. So to maybe really make this point here, what the function would do, it gets the string, then it would think, well, what is the, the reverse of that? Well, it is A, B, B, C, B, B, A. And then it would just compare these. And if it's the same, it would return true, otherwise not. And that's it. And honestly, in my opinion, there isn't really much that could be wrong here because this is basically how a palindrome is defined. It is something which is equal to its own reverse. If we read it backwards, it still says the same. So that's all. There's, it is definitely a small function. It is very declarative, meaning it is basically just stating what it is supposed to be. It is basically the mathematical definition of what a palindrome is defined to be, something that's equal to itself when read backwards. And thus, I would argue, it is rather easy to verify by inspection because you don't have to think, well, is n minus i minus 1 right or not? Do I have to subtract 1 or not? Do I have to add 1? Not sure. Maybe, maybe try it. Just say s is equal to the reverse of s. Not much more. And there is no mutable state. We will be talking about state in a, in a few seconds. And the, the absence of any mutable state, of the absence of anything written in memory like this variable n, means, or this is one of the things that makes this function pure. And we will be talking about purity in a few seconds because this is really a central concept of Haskell or functional programming in general. So this is the first example. Does this already make sense? If not, then I guess it really makes sense if you ask already because I really don't want to risk losing you at some point. Okay, that looks great. Okay, lovely. So assume you say, well, yeah, that's all fine and dandy, but I really don't want to do Haskell because, I don't know, or because my boss says, no, you, you won't be doing Haskell, you'll stay working on Python for whatever reason. So, and this is what I mentioned earlier, the, the second like, value proposition of this talk, hopefully, that you will be able to also steal some concepts from functional programming and run with it and maybe add it to your everyday programming. So maybe we can write Python in a more Haskell-like way. Well, the first line will stay the same. We have to define our function, define it as is palindrome, something that takes a string, returns a boolean. And then we actually can write something that's very similar to Haskell, namely, again, one single line. We return a comparison between S and something that probably looks super weird to you if you don't have any experience in Python, this S um, square bracket colon colon minus one, and this is one of the many things that Python offers as syntactic sugar, it basically means the reverse, put very simple. Um, this now is much smaller. It has the, the same degree of being declarative, like the mathematical definition of the word palindrome. And in this way, I would argue it is rather easy to verify by inspection. If you know that this square bracket colon colon minus one square bracket is just meaning, well, you reverse it. Um, if you have Python experience, you know this because it's like one of the, the standard tricks. If not, you could just use some kind of reverse function. So I would say this way of writing it in Python is generally easier to verify than the previous way where we had to think about potential off by one errors, about storing things in memory and whatever. So I guess this is maybe something that you may want to keep in mind that you are able in Python and also in many other languages to do something rather similar like you would be doing in a fully functional programming language.
Okay, oh yeah, Numidus said, like I said. Um, and if we now continue to think a little bit about this function is palindrome that I have shown to you two slides ago, we also touch upon something that I briefly teased upon, namely the ability to compose functions in what is usually called the modular manner. So let's briefly... Why isn't it doing anything? Okay, now it's doing something. That's weird. Okay, apparently I... I Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, something apparently went wrong here in my animations, I don't know. So you see, uh, Keynote is not functional, we can run into runtime errors, I'm sorry. Um, what you see here is again, in the upper part, the is palindrome function like we sketched before. And we use this function reverse there, and now a valid objection would be, yeah, well, of course it's just a one-liner because you delegate all the hard work to this reverse function. And everything is a one-liner if I just call some library. That's a fair objection, and for that reason I wanted to do here is, and I actually wanted to build this up point by point, but I failed to do so. I said, well, then let's just inspect what this function reverse does. And now I have to go through this without being able to, to reveal this point by point, but let's, let's bear with me. So the first thing that reverse does is, well, it first declares what type is supposed to be, and then there's something that may look a little bit weird that is highlighted, namely these square brackets A. So there are two things to unpack here. The first thing are these square brackets, and square brackets is just a Haskell way of saying it's a list. So this means reverse takes a list of A and returns a list of A. Well, what is A? A is anything you want, as long as this A is the very same as this A. And this makes sense, because you can reverse a list of numbers, you can reverse a list of chars, which would basically be a string, you can reverse a list of anything you want. It doesn't matter. It is a list, and any list can be reversed, completely regardless of what type this list is. And then we come to the second line, and this is just saying, well, the reverse of an empty list, so these, these pair of empty square brackets just means it's an empty list, which I guess makes sense, because there's nothing in it, is just defined to be, yet again, another empty list, which makes sense. And the third thing, third line that may look a little bit weird now, and this is another piece of Haskell syntax that might be nice to know, um, a thing about lists in Haskell is that you usually address them with this idiom of x colon xs, and this may look a little bit confusing, but it's actually super, super simple um, if you know that Haskell internally stores list as a single linked list. So you always have the head node and the remaining stuff. So this just means this is a list. This one is the very first element of the list, and the xs, all of that is just the rest. So the remaining n minus 1 elements. And this just means, okay, our function reverse takes a list with one head element and the remaining tail. And what it returns is, again, on the right-hand side of this equality sign, it is, well, something that is composed with this double plus operator. And we will be talking about the double plus in a few seconds. And what this double plus does is it actually puts together two lists. And on the left-hand side, well, maybe first talk about the right-hand side. The right-hand side is this x put into a list, the first element. So assume our list maybe look like, I don't know, a, b, cd, then this a would be the x, and the remaining stuff is the xs. And what the function then does is, it takes the first element, the x, in this case would nothing but an a, and puts it at the very end into a list. This is just because double plus needs two lists. So what it would do is, it would put on the right-hand side this a, here would be the double plus, and the remaining stuff here on the left-hand side would be a recursive call to reverse with all the remaining stuff. So that would be B, C, and D. And then if you were so inclined, you can expand this. And what you then would find is this is something plus B plus A. And then you would be able to again expand this and again and again. And at the end, you would really, I, I, can, I can guarantee you, you would end up with D, C, B, A. So I acknowledge this is maybe a little bit of, of well, not a little bit, quite a bit of, of new syntax. But I was hoping that there might be some, some virtue in introducing you to this. So if there are any questions about this weird list stuff, then please say right now and loud. There's no shame in that, because I think there's really virtue in understanding that. Really? Okay, wow, that's good. Okay, I'm very happy. That's great. So um, let's finally... Okay, I, I'm, I'm not sure what is happening with my animations here, but okay, 
either way, this reverse function that we have just examined is generic because it can work on any type. It's a standalone function because, well, basically it's self-contained and you can and will use this function over and over again. It will crop up in many, many functions. For instance, if you say, well, I want to have the last element of a list, what you can do is, well, we reverse it and take the first one. And this is really what I was referring to earlier when we say, well, we take many, many small functions and we can easily verify by, um, all of these small little Lego building blocks by looking at them, and we put them together to build from the bottom up our final piece of software. Obviously, it's also a rather small function, three lines. It is pure. We will be talking in a second about that. And, well, I claimed it is easy to verify. I acknowledge maybe it was, upon first glance, not completely easy to verify for you, but it is rather easy to verify if you think about it for maybe a minute or so. So, um, I guess it boils down to being rather easy to verify because, I mean, what this function does, it, it takes the first element and puts it at the end, and then it calls itself with the rest. From the rest, you take the first one, put it again at the end, then you call yourself with the rest. And it's basically like you have a stack of cards. You take the bottom, the, the top one, put it on the bottom. Then you take the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. At the end, you have reverted it. Okay. And we can go even deeper by examining this double plus, which actually turns out to be yet another function. So we are going down and down this tree of bottom-up composition, and as it turns out, well, if we briefly look back, we had this double plus, which I promised you we will be talking about, and the time is now for that. This double plus, and this is nearly identical code uh, from the standard library in Haskell, it's called the prelude. Um, it's just a tiny little bit edited for more clarity, but it's nearly verbatim original code from Haskell. It is a function, for operators you put them in round brackets, because if you were to not put them there, the compiler would be confused. You just say, well, it's an operator, that's why I put it in brackets. It's taking a list of A and another list of A, and on the right-hand side, the rightmost thing is just what it returns. So it says, well, we take a list of something, maybe a list of, of some integers, maybe one, two, three. Then we take another list, maybe four, five, six, and what's supposed to pop out at the very end is the rightmost element is, again, some list of integers, which makes sense. If you concatenate two lists of integers, put them together, at the end, hopefully, you'll end up with another larger, obviously, but still list of integers. And I just talked about that. And this is, again, defined only in two lines. It is also rather elegant. The first line says, well, if we have an empty list and some list that we call ys, well, obviously, empty list plus some list will give you that some list, because if you tag an empty list on any end of, of a list, well, you don't really add anything. And the second thing, I'm not sure why this is misbehaving, but I'm, okay, anyway. And the second piece of code here just says, well, we want to concatenate two lists. The first list is again written in this XXS idiom, and the second list we just call YS. And what is happening is we're taking the very first element, the X, put it on the very leftmost ending, and then what we add afterwards is, again, a concatenation of the remaining XS with the YS. So what it's doing basically is it takes the first one and then calls itself with the rest. Then it takes the first one again, calls itself with the rest, and so on and so on. And at some point, we have taken all the first elements from that list, and this list is empty, and we just tag on the remaining YS stuff. So I guess that might be bit weird. Did it make sense what I say? If not, then just yell, please. No, okay, well, okay, that's good. Um, okay, sorry. So the point here, what is happening? The point here basically was just like, we can go down this tree and at some point we're basically hitting really rock bottom where there's no place to go else. And we have really always have been dealing with these small kind of functions that we can reason about that we put together to build up anything that we want. Okay, so enough of that. Let's talk about this stuff called purity that I briefly teasered upon earlier. So purity, like I said, means if you have a function, then the function will map some input onto always exactly one specific output that's never different. So, for instance, a mathematician would sim simply call that a function. So, for instance, if you say you have a function f of x, that we define to be x squared, then for every x value, we will always get out exactly one y value. Wherever you go, and it is always the same. So, a pure function, or as a mathematician would call it a function, 
can't be something like that because this x value here would be mapped onto two things. And this basically just means if you put something in the function, you can always be sure you get the exact, like get one thing back and this is always the same thing. So you can think of it as a black box and as long as you put a in it, you will always get some function of A back, and this function of A will always be the very same element. It will not change if something else in the code changes. And it also does not leak any side effects, which simply means it does not influence what the other parts of the code are doing. And this is obviously a pretty nice thing to have, because if I have a function, and I know that this function does not interfere with, well, basically what all of my other functions are doing, then these things are nicely separated. And it's completely enough to only look at each function on its own. We don't have to think about how these functions interact because they do not interact in any way. Every function does its own thing. And this is a great thing. The opposite of that would obviously be called an impure function. And this may, for instance, depend on some global variable that influences what the function is doing, or it may change some global variable, which in turn would influence what other functions are doing. And of course, this is not a nice thing because in this way, we would not be able to think about a single function only by looking at this function. We would always be forced to think about what are the other functions doing? What have the other functions done to my memory? Where is my, in which state is my program? What is happening now? And this makes our life really easier, basically. Obviously, you cannot always avoid impurities. For instance, well, if you say, if, I mean, you could say, a pure function is basically completely, a, com a completely pure piece of software is basically useless because it would never interact with the real world, obviously. So as soon as you're writing real software, at some point you have to interact with the real world, sadly, and then it becomes a bit impure. For instance, you want to read from a file, you may ask your user something and then you wait for the user to do stuff and the user will not always be doing exactly the same. The user is, well, sometimes he wants something else, obviously. Or you may want to write something to a database and in this way you would change the state of the world in which the function or in which the program is operating. So you cannot always avoid impurity, but what you can do, and Haskell is really big on this, but you can also basically do this in every other language, you can very cleanly separate and really take the very few pieces of code that interact with the messy, impure real world, and you clearly say these are impure, and all the remaining 99% of things, so like reversing a list or, or squaring a number, these will always be pure, and these you can always rather easily verify, and only these handful of places where impurity really enters the picture, you have to think a bit more, and a bit more hard. But you can cleanly separate these concerns, and this is something you can basically do in every other language. And this is really something that I have seen many people from the object-oriented world, or from the, from the um, procedural world, picking up as a concept. They say, well, let's try to make as many functions pure as we can, because for all of these many pure functions, we can be pretty sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, and we only have to really worry about the places where the real world enters the picture. And now we're coming to this big fancy word of referential transparency, and this is basically something that follows from, uh, from purity. Namely, it means that's basically a very simple word for a very complicated word for a very simple concept, and we are actually all familiar with that concept from math. And it just means if two things are equal, x and y, then at every place where we want to, we can exchange x with y and the other way around. And I guess this is really something where you will now ask yourself, well, what's the deal with that? Obviously, you can do that. If 3 is 3, or if 3 plus 5 is 8, then I can replace 8 with 3 plus 5 wherever I want, and vice versa. Um, yes, basically, it is a very, very trivial concept. There's just a very fancy word for it. But the key idea of that is just basically, if I know for sure that my function will always map the same input to the same output, I can very easily reason about what the function is doing. And whenever I see this function call, I know exactly what the function will return. And this makes it easier to think about how the individual pieces of the code base fit together. As a funny aside, in natural languages, referential transparency does not necessarily hold. There's a funny example. For instance, you can say Abraham Lincoln is, or much rather was, the 16th president of the USA. Um, and you can also say Abe Lincoln played a very important role in abolishing the slavery. And so, by referential transparency, you can say, well, yes, the 16th president of the USA played a major role in abolishing the slavery. However, it does not always hold. For instance, you can say, if things had gone differently in 1860, Stephen Douglas would have been the 16th president of the USA. 
However, we cannot say, well, if things had gone differently in 1860, Stephen Douglas would have been Abe Lincoln. That's obviously nonsense. So whenever you're doing natural language stuff, then referential transparency does not hold. But in functional programming, it holds. And this is a very, very nice thing because it makes stuff really easier to reason about. Okay, maybe a second example where we'll be talking about this, what I call the declarative style. So I think you all know what a factorial is. Um, namely, basically a product. So if you have the number five, you don't have the factorial. Then you say, well, it's basically one times two times three times four times five. And the factorial of zero is defined to be one for reasons of convenience, basically. There's no rhyme and reason to it except for it makes stuff easy. And the nice thing is you can take these two things and you can basically translate them verbatim into Haskell. You can say, well, my function fuck maps an integer onto an integer. Factorial of zero is defined to be one. And factorial of n is this number n times factorial of n minus one. And you see, this line is basically equal to that one. And this one is equal to that one. So you can basically just translate the formulas into code basically one by one. And this makes stuff, well, rather easy to verify. I briefly have to check that, okay, I'm running out of time. Okay, I'll have to skip over some stuff. I'm very sorry. Um, I just wanna say many roads lead to Rome or Rome, obviously. You can define also the factorial, like I said, as this weird product, but that also translate nicely into Haskell that you just say, well, it's a product of the numbers from one to N. So my point basically here is Haskell makes it easy to translate such clean and concise definitions into very cleanly and concisely defined pieces of code. This one is actually faster because it avoids recursion. Um, I think I'll have to skip over some things here because this would, yeah, I, only, I already have talked about for 40 minutes. So we will skip about some things, which is sadly, well, it's, it's rather sad because I was actually intending to show you some really cool things, but I'll have to skip about these. You can look into the slides if you want. So let me briefly jump to types now. So the first thing I hopefully, I hope you, you kind of got the message. Functions that are small and pure makes it easy. You look at them, you see, well, it obviously needs to be right. It's basically a one-to-one -one translation of my definition. And because you know the function is pure, you know it doesn't interact with all the other functions in my code base. So it's just okay to just look at this one function and make sure, convince yourself, okay, that looks right to me. You don't have to think about what are all the other nasty functions doing to this function because it doesn't matter. The function is pure. Okay, all the other stuff we skip and now let's talk about types. So as you have seen, in all the pieces of code I have shown or skipped over in that case, we always add these type declarations. And if I may say so, hopefully we always have them. You don't have to, but you should, and it is good practice. So you have seen there in all these functions, there were cool type definitions. Um, I wanted to show you some more cool things, for instance, this map one, but we have to skip over that sadly. But my point is, whenever I show to you some piece of Haskell, we always in the first line had this type definition. Why do we bother? Well, first actually, and this is a bit of a mental or psychological hack, it gets us started. Because we think about my function is supposed to take type so-and-so and supposed to return type so-and-so. And in this way, we have already written down the first line of our function and we have started to think about the function. So for instance, factorial takes an integer, returns an integer. We write that down. We already have written one of three lines. We feel sufficiently accomplished. The creative juices are going. and. We actually have a sort of documentation for ourselves and more importantly, and this is really the core concept why types are so cool, it's also documentation for the compiler, a piece of a kind of contract that the compiler can make sure you don't violate. So for instance, if by some error we would call fuck with the string, the compiler would instantly yell at us and say, well, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. What's the difference to, to maybe say C? In C, the compiler would also yell at you if you were to call this function fact with an integer, uh, with a string, sorry. Well, yes, the previous error would have been caught by that, but still previous or traditional type systems are not as powerful as they could be. And we can actually, because they do not represent any real world meaning, construct examples where the C compiler would really fail tremendously at catching errors. So for instance, assume we have this function that is supposed to take an integer, as you can see here, that may be a customer ID, an ID that is used in a database to represent a customer. This is, I guess, in real world, most often an integer or some kind of, 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 of integer number. And the function would do some magic. It would query the database. 
ask the database, please give me the customer that has this internal ID. And then you could obviously query this function with some database ID, one, two, three. You would call the function, this would compile nicely, it would really much, it really do what you want to do. However, the problem is um, you have some other integer that contains some customer number that maybe your company's billing department uses, maybe 33040. And you can be very sure that the billing number or the, the customer number that the billing department uses will not be the same number that your database uses internally as a key to store your customer. The problem is this is also an integer. So you could also call this function with this customer number and the compiler would say, oh, well, looks good to me, it's an integer, no problem. But it is very clearly not what you want, obviously. So this would compile, but at some points, maybe after some days, weeks or years, this would probably burst into flames and cause some real problems because you, would, because you might build the wrong customer for the wrong product and this would be really a problem. So Haskell allows us to define types with meaning. We are able to make our own types. What we can do, and I have to abbreviate this a little bit, what we can do in Haskell is we can make our own types. So for instance, we can make type dbid that is basically based on an integer or we could also make a type that we call customer number that is also an integer, but both of these types are now not interchangeable. And what you can then do is you can write a function that only takes a database ID and returns to some customer object that we have defined elsewhere. And if we then call this function with a database ID n, then it would do some kind of querying the database, returning you some stuff, and a call like that might look like so. You you use this function, you call it with a database ID 1, 2, 3, it would compile, it would do what it is intended. However, if you would call this function with a number that is tagged as a customer number like your billing department uses, the compiler would instantly yell and say, no, it is still an integer, of course, but it has a completely different meaning. You have defined this type to be something else, you can't do that. So the compiler would yell at us and it would refuse to compile that because the type system understands that doesn't make sense. So it would rightfully get rejected and you wouldn't be able to ship this code and avoid this potentially very costly and embarrassing error. You can do that in Python. This is a bit awkward because Python was not intended to allow that. So there are like ways around that you can do it. I'll have to skip over that, I'm sorry. But you can do type hinting and you can check and enforce these type hints rigorously with a type checker like MyPy. You can look at this if you want to. I will not go into the Python details here, but you can do something like that. And if you test it, this would work. However, if you would call your function with something that's a type customer number and then run this code to your type checker, you would get this colorful error that would say, well, your argument one to that function has an incompatible type, it's a customer number, but I expect the database ID, don't do that. So this using a type system, you can also replicate, for instance, in Python. You could also kind of do it in C if you put all these types in structs of their own. It is possible, but it's not really elegant and it's rather cumbersome. So in this case, we would be, well, in Python, would be able to see we did something wrong. The type checker would refuse that, we would be happy, we would fix the problem, everything would be great. And we can even step up our game another notch. And this is the last thing I will be talking about. Luckily, I still have a very few minutes. We can imbue these types with even more meanings to do something, and this is another catchphrase that's often thrown around very often, um, making invalid states non-representable in your code. That sounds again very academic and very fancy, so let's make a very, very concrete example. Assume we're a big bank, and obviously we have bank accounts, yes, um, and what we want to store for our bank accounts may be an account number and the balance, so the amount of, of cash on it. And now the problem is an account may also get terminated. A customer may decide to, no, I, I empty my account, I don't care, whatever, delete that. But for legal reasons, our bank for instance, may not be allowed to delete the record because for, I don't know, tax reasons or whatever. So we would extend our type to also have some kind of field that keeps track of whether our account is terminated or not. And if it's terminated, ideally, again, for, I don't know, tax or legal reasons, we also want to save at which date this account got terminated. So the tax rate can be calculated or whatever. So we would end up with objects that have quite a lot of different um, fields. And for instance, upon debugging, we might run into a record like that. We have some account number, 47754840, actually just a random number I generated. And we see, okay, the account balance is zero, but the account is not terminated. Well, that looks a bit weird and becomes even weirder when we continue debugging that because 
despite the account being obviously not terminated, it has a date of termination, 1st of uh, September 23. So this object can't exist in real world. This doesn't make sense. An account cannot be obviously not terminated, but have nonetheless a date of termination saved. This is something that you cannot see in the real world. Yet, this way of formalizing our bank account type allows us to represent that. And that's a bad thing, because if at some point some function does something that causes an error like that, this bad record will happily get passed around, and at some point, it, at some point it will cause lots of pain and will crash and burn, because, for instance, you may want to try to transfer money from an account that was terminated, or some other stuff that should not happen. And what you can do is, you can add more meaning, you can split this account type into two different kinds. You can say we have the type of an open account that has a number and the balance. And you can say we have another type that's a terminated account. And a terminated account still has a number. It has no balance anymore because it needs to be empty, but it has a date of termination. And then in this way, this nonsense state that I've sketched out earlier, we cannot simply, we cannot at all represent this in our runtime anymore. So this way, this nonsense state, this implausible state that does not occur in the real world is entirely impossible to also occur in the code. And this is a very great thing because in this way you can again avoid that by some random accident because you didn't pay attention in one of your 27 functions, you generate an object that is not self-consistent anymore. And this is a very nice thing because this makes the type, or you can, this allows us to make the type of a function more precise. For instance, you can say, well, our function that we use to make a transaction is only supposed to take an open account. And the moment you try to put a terminated account into that function, again, the compiler would yell at you and this would obviously be something that can't happen. Okay, so as a wrap up, in conclusion, I hope I was able to convince you that functional programming makes it a little bit harder to write code that is unreliable and incorrect because, um, like I said, we're able to catch a lot of evil and nasty things happening at compile time already. And I understand that I have dumped a lot of concepts to you and a lot of Haskell code too, and if you decide, well, Haskell, not yet, maybe not at all, it's not kind of my vibe, then maybe, I hope at least, that maybe you're able to take some of these concepts and incorporate them in your day-to-day -day code. Like, for instance, thinking about making your functions declarative so that you can just look at them and they, you can be sure that they are obviously correct. Or thinking about the purity of functions to avoid side effects, functions influencing what other functions do. Or maybe thinking about taking these really, really tiny functions that you can check and verify by just looking at them intently and building in a bottom-up approach by combining these little Lego blocks that are all rather sure to be correct in some bigger product that obviously is also composed into something that necessarily also needs to be correct. And finally, I hope I was able in these few seconds to also try to get along the message of why a very strong and expressive type system is a very nice and useful thing to model the real world and to catch lots of many nasty things already at compile time, avoiding runtime errors like your rocket deviating at a 90 degree angle from your intended path and then due to atmospheric stress, releasing the boosters and yeah, basically exploding in a huge ball of hydrogen fire. Like I said, especially nice is to make stuff that's implausible, that cannot happen, that cannot occur, to even be entirely run and representable in your code. With this, I'm done, just in time, five minutes question and answer. Also, questions are always very welcome. By all means, hit me up when you see me roaming around here. I'll be here until the end of the, of the event. Just talk to me if you want to see what the other slides were con uh, containing. Feel free to hit me or, well, it's now me, not us, up. You can also talk to me on Telegram if you want to. You can also talk to me on Matrix. I have a Matrix account now. I kind of understand how Matrix works. Kinda. Um, you can try to also hit me up there. I might even be able to answer. Of course, in person, I usually look like that. However, starting tomorrow, I will also roam a little bit around looking like that. If you see that coyote, that's where my name Yoti comes from. Also, do feel very welcome to hit him up. I guess he will also be very happy and delighted. And with that, well, that's just the appendix. So thank you very much for your attention and feel free to use the remaining three minutes or so for Q&A. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, uh, th thank you, Jota. Are there questions from the audience? <laughs> okay. Oh, um, that's usually a bad sign, I fear. <laughs> there is a question. <laughs> yes, that's, oh my God, that's so great. Because whenever there's no single question, that's usually a bad sign in my experience. Yeah. Hi, first of all, thanks for the great talk. Thank um, you. 
is the order in which you define uh, the functions um, enforced at compile time or could that happen that mo more than one cases um, match? Yeah, it's a lovely question. That's exactly what can happen. The order, I think you mean, uh, just let me ask to clarify this, I think you mean the order in which we write the individual lines of a function, right? Yes, that's actually extremely important and I'm very glad you raised that. Um, Ah, it is updating the animations here, but not on that screen. Okay, that's mighty confusing. Now I also made a huge fool out of myself because it was working all the time. Yes, okay, it's a very good question because you have to write it in this order. Because what the interpreter or the compiler, or when you, when you call a function, does it, it goes from top to bottom. So it first checks, is there a zero? If so, return a one. Or is there any other number that we call n, then do this. And if we were to swap the, uh, the two lines, then a zero would also trigger the line fac n, and then it would return the product of one to zero, which would be an empty list, because a list from one to zero is empty, and the product of an empty list would, I think, it would be undefined, and you would actually get a runtime error. So, uh, yes, that's a good thing. Think about the order, and always start with a specific case, and at the end, the most general case. Yes, thank you. Great question. Are there more questions? Yes. That makes me happy. <laughs> so, uh, just because you brought up these two examples from, uh, yeah, uh, spacecrafts, yes. um, I mean, like NASA doesn't write most of its software in Haskell, they and should. yeah, um, <laughs> no, so right. like yes. the, the the problem is there are other constraints, right? So, um, like for example, you, you don't get all of this stuff for free. You have to pay for it. For example, Haskell is using a garbage collector yes. for its memory stuff, and yes. like also of you have course. other performance performance constraints so yes. like what's like uh, of course there are situations when this is fine mm -hmm. but um, like what what's the solution for for um, like situations when you have hardware constraints or yes. whatever of course if you have certain hardware constraints you want to really work in an embedded system where you have like I don't know two bytes of RAM or whatever yes you you cannot run Haskell on that sadly so I I hope that I, I was kind of expecting that Haskell is is like is the hammer that you shouldn't hit everything with because it's a nail. So um, I guess my only value proposition for that case might be that there's still value in thinking about your pieces of code in terms of some of these concepts that I've talked about. So you can still, even if you write in an embedded system in C or whatever, you can still say, well, I would like to try to separate those many functions that I can verify independently because they are pure, like the sum of two numbers should obviously never change. Three plus five is always eight, hopefully. From the very few pieces where stuff can get ugly, so where I expect an input from the user or where I have some measurement from a sensor or whatever. And then you can still, for instance, try to reason about these small pieces of code that are independent and pure. So I guess the only answer is yes, you can't do that all the time. But I think there's still some virtue in some of these concepts that I have mentioned. But yeah, you are very right. So I can it a slight bit uh, because we did refactorings uh, in, yes. in comparable language when I actually was my computer, uh, my diploma science uh, cool. uh, thesis. Um, and we did this in Prolog, which is another mm -hmm. uh, comparable language, mm -hmm. not really, but yes. Uh, and it was faster than other solutions in other languages because it's optimized for these languages are optimized for all this recursive stuff. Also, yeah, the fun thing actually is um, there's always this, this idea that Hestel is slow. Usually it's right if you if you're a beginner or maybe also if you're somebody like me who's like not an S Haskell like like God then Haskell is usually slow. I mean my C is faster as my Haskell and I'm neither a good C nor a good Haskell programmer. But there are actually some companies um, like high frequency trading shops that rely entirely on Haskell and high frequency trading is really about like split microseconds I guess and they can put it off with Haskell. But that really takes some mental load. So you gotta be really a pro, which I'm certainly not. But if you really know what you're doing, you can also write high performance stuff in Haskell. But yeah, that's, that's a good addition, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we run out of time for more questions. If you have more questions, please find- I'm uh, here, talk to me yeah. whenever you want. <laughs>